Thanks everyone for joining us on this Saturday afternoon. Tomorrow uh, is National Canoe Day. So it sort of makes sense that we're here. Sure. Sure. <laughs> no, it would make sense if we were but, outside. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but tomorrow. But tomorrow we can do go that. Yeah. Tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> so it makes sense that we're inside today. <laughs> to remind you to go outside tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, and it's been such a pleasure for us here to, to work with Brad Coffey and um, to hear him talk about these works uh, and really even like the process as, we, as he's been developing it has been such a joy. So we're really, we're really glad to have a crowd here today to, to hear him speak. <laughs> then we're going to put it out online so everybody can hear it. All right. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate that. Um, it is a beautiful day outside, so. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it is an absolute pleasure to be able to show here in, in Peterborough, in, um, in my almost hometown. Yeah. It, is, it, it is my home, my home city in, some, in so many ways. Um, uh, what, where, where am I going? <laughs> I'm lost already. Uh, get me in a canoe. Um, the, the show is called Setting Afloat um, on a River in Spate. And it's, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, it's, it's taken from the description of an essay by uh, a man named Wendell Berry who's uh, an American writer, and it was, it was a, an essay that was written back in 1960, oh, I think it was 61, um, when it was, was actually written, and uh, the, the version I have is from, is, is from a, a, re, a reproduction from 1964. Um, and he talks about um, the river where his farm is in, in Kentucky, and he, experiences the river when it has risen. So it's called the rise, and the, the, the water has, has increased 20 feet, and it no longer is held by its banks. It changes everything. And I, f I felt very much like the experience of putting this exhibition together and what's been happening for the last two years is my river in spate. Um, I've had my eyes opened uh, to, to some new directions, some new ideas, new ways of thinking about things, um, and, and, and hence, hence the title. So a river in spate is a river overflowing. Um, it, changes, it changes how we see the world, because although it's the same world, it's, it, it has altered. So, you experience it in different ways. And that's, that's what I'm hoping will also happen in the, in the viewing of the work that I'm presenting here. I know it's happened for me in the making of the work. So, to start with, um, is reflections. Um, this is the mirrored canoe, and uh, <laughs> yeah, um, we need the hazer. The hazer and some laser lights, and then we got it going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not a smoke machine or a fog machine, I'm told. The hazer's the ticket. Um, I, I started this, I started this uh, mirroring this canoe at the, uh, at the Canadian Canoe Museum. I was fortunate to be artist in residence there and have an opportunity to work in that. Uh, in that space, thank you, thank you. They will thank you also. Give them money. <laughs> uh, but I'm sure the art gallery would, here would thank you also for that. Um, <laughs> the, the canoe um, was a gift from, from the curator there, um, Jeremy Ward. He had started uh, restoring this boat. It was actually his first attempted restoration. Uh, it was an old canoe that his brother had found on the street somewhere in a small town 
in southern Ontario, picked it up for a hundred bucks. He used it for quite a while and Jeremy acquired it and decided he was going to fix it up. And when he started into it, he realized pretty quickly that it, it's not going to be worth the effort to make the boat that he wanted to make out of it. Um, it's not, it was a, it's not a, a boat of any particular providence. It's someone made it. It's a, but it is a cedar strip and it had been covered in fiberglass. So he'd stripped it out and uh, got all the woodwork out of it, cleaned up the varnish out of the interior, had sanded down the fiberglass, and then realized, nah, no. Nah. Hung it on the side of his woodshed, and there it sat for 10 years, protecting the outer row of wood, <laughs> firewood. So when I got it, uh, it was covered in moss and lichen, and, uh, but I could see the, uh, the potential in it. Uh, for, for what I wanted to do. And so I, I began by, by cleaning the boat and then drawing on the, and, and fixing the fiberglass on the exterior, then drawing a map of a bit of our area on the outside. So at the top of the boat, at the bow, is Jack's Lake, and at the bottom, is Rice Lake. So this is a map. This is a map of our area. Little Lake is whoop, right. Where are we? Oh, right here. Sorry. Right here. And we are right about there. Okay. Um, yeah, you are here. I was thinking maybe I should just get people to like stick little red dots on it. This is where I live. Um, uh, so, so what I did, I, I, drew, I drew the map on the boat and then started in on cutting mirrors, 12-inch tile mirror, cutting it into roughly rectangular forms and uh, applying it to the surface. So I'm trying to um, give the effect of uh, the, the geography in the area. So those, the limestone plain uh, south of Stony Lake, it, all of the mirrors, no, you know, looks like farm fields or maybe suburban cul-de-sacs, that kind of thing. The, the area above Stony Lake, I broke the mirror. And so it's in a, a much more random pattern. So I'm trying to reflect there the, 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 um, the, the granite of the Canadian Shield. So, so I'm trying to instill a little bit of, of the the geology into how I'm dealing with the mirror. The map itself, yeah, it's like all maps, it lies. It's bent and twisted to fit the boat. It doesn't quite do what it does. Um, let's see. So, a bit of shemong, because I needed to have a bit of shemong on the boat. Uh, so it's kind of bent in a little bit, but up to Lakefield, Catchawanuka clear, Buck, or, um, Stony runs across, and then up above, as I said, was, is Jack's Lake, and Jack's Lake's a bit larger than everything else, because, well, that's my home lake, so. <laughs> and it's got a great shape, and it really did a nice thing around the bow, so. So there's aesthetic choices that happen as well in, in doing this. In any case, so this is my, my, the, my landscape on the exterior of the boat. This is the, the area that I, I know and I've come to know. Um, and it, it, it's sort of a, a, a bookend in some ways um, to uh, an experience of the Trent Severn Waterway from when I graduated from Sheridan College. Um, well, maybe we're on record here. I should say when I finished at Sheridan College. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I, I, pa I, I paddled from uh, my family home on Sturgeon Lake out to uh, up the Trent Severn and out to Georgian Bay. And that was, that experience formed uh, a great deal of the work that I did for my first exhibition, um, my first solo exhibition in Montreal, 20 odd years ago um, and and I thought 
that I, I wanted to try and do something at the, with the southern end of the, the system from Sturgeon Lake south. So, so it, this, this became the, a, a focal point for me to try and, try and bring some of that end of the water system, but then I had to connect it to where I actually lived. So from Stony up, you have Jack's Creek and Eels Creek um, run, running up into the, into the bow of the boat. So again, my landscape on the outside. I mirrored the interior very simply just trying to mimic the planking that, was, that uh, this old boat has, and it was blank. It was just a blank uh, canvas in, in many ways. And that writing that, are, that appears on there is, is actually a, a writing from a trip journal. Um, and it was a trip that I had yet to take. And, and so the, the process of, of getting this boat finished, um, in the process of getting this boat finished, I orchestrated a residency in Belgium at a glass center there. And as part of that process, they as, as, as part of their process, they had um, a collaborative thing going on with a glass center in the Netherlands, because there, there's a, a cultural exchange program that was happening um, last year. And so we thought, why don't we send the mirrored canoe over there and I'll paddle it from the glass center in Belgium to the glass center in the Netherlands. And so that's what we did. And so the journal that's on here is my trip journal from taking this boat from that one glass center to the other. Um, and it's now been sculpted. If you look closely at the, the exterior, you'll see cracks and bits of mirror missing. And I think it, what it's done is, is, is added that layer of journey onto it. So it's added, added a, another, another it's, it's not pristine anymore. It is as a boat should be used. Um, and what else to say about the, oh yes, so I've, I've drawn the map um, of, of, the, of the journey from Lommel to Leerdom on the interior and then written the journal to sort of coincide roughly with the locations as you, as you come down the boat. Um, but of course my writing is kind of scratchy and scribbly, so. And it is just a trip journal, so it's not that interesting to read. <laughs> there were fascinating moments, but... Uh, um, and then, and, and as part of that process, um, in, keeping, in keeping this journal that, I, that I've written on here, I was also keeping a video diary. Um, I had a GoPro camera, and I was, I was taking imagery along the way. And the, the video that uh, plays upstairs was, was put together by a, a, a Belgian producer, Ivan Hattigens. I'm probably really screwing up his last name, but that's okay. He's actually in Istanbul right now, so he won't even know. Uh, lovely, lovely guy. And he was really excited about the material I gave him. He filmed from the launch of the canoe in in Lommel to the, and at the arrival in Leerdom, and then we did a, um, an evening where I, uh, he filmed an interview that uh, was essentially a long conversation with my good friend, uh, Jeroen Mays, who runs the Glass Center in, in Lommel. And, and so that, that conversation forms the basis of the, of, of the video that's, that, that runs upstairs. It's a really, beautiful document. I, um, I couldn't have been happier when, when, that, was, when that was finalized. It's, it's uh, 13 minutes of, um, as Jeroen said, it's a lovely uh, portrait of you at a time. And I, I, I think that, um, that really, <laughs> 
I get emotional at time to time. So I, when I think about certain things and, and connections to people. So you'll excuse me if I uh, <laughs> get a little choked up and hesitate. Uh, what's that? Uh, sure, fire a question. Do you want a question or do you want a moment? <laughs> <laughs> well, how far was the journey, Brett? Uh, the journey, uh, as, as the crow flies, it's only 100 kilometers. But the, the journey weaves and winds and, um, oh, Jeroen likes to say it was 150 kilometers, but it was actually like 135. But, you know, yeah. we can, the number sounds better, so everything says 150. And how long were you on? Uh, it was uh, it was six days of paddling. Um, uh, the one day one day was actually happen, had to happen beforehand. It was a a, a bit of a um, <laughs> a creative way to make it all work, because what happened was the launch became an event for the, no. the, um, the uh, glass center in Lommel. So what we, what we did um, was uh, the sponsors of the, of the museum have an annual event and there are gifts made that are given to the sponsors and Jeroen had the brilliant idea that I would, while I was there working and the, the process, so the process of, Going over and doing an art, a residency there, what I did was I made the first half of this glass canoe in Lommel. And then I paddled to Leerdam in the Netherlands and came home, a uh, studio tour here last September, I was home for a month, then went back over for another month finished the other half of the canoe and then it was there was an exhibition in in Leerdam with this boat and this boat uh, in the uh, greenhouses in the courtyard outside of this old manor house which uh, forms the museum uh, the glass museum the Dutch National Glass Museum in Leerdam so what Jeroen wanted to do was create a a bunch of hype around it and make it into an event. So the, the, uh, the, the launch became this big party, which had to happen on a specific day because he was doing a, con it became this whole convoluted thing that got squeezed down. It's like, I'm on a paddling trip on a boat covered in glass. I have no idea how long it's gonna take me to go from one place to the other. Uh, you're squeezing me here, man. How are we going to make this happen? So we, we slipped a day in in front, and I paddled a section of it, uh, and then we came back, and then we skipped that section during the process. So, so it was, a, you know, it was a bit of a stretch, but, um, you know, that's the reality of it. So did you have your but, gear? Like, your, like, you packed it? Yeah, I, I sent all my gear over as well. It was all in the boat when I shipped the boat over. Yeah, yeah, it was all art material. Yeah. <laughs> art installation. Yeah. yeah. Or performance. I forget how we worded it on the, uh, on the uh, documentation that went over. But so, yeah, there was a, I made a, uh, I had made a, a box big enough to hold this, to ship this over. It's about 140 pounds, maybe 100, maybe 150. I can carry it, but I can't clean and jerk it off the ground. I didn't want to portage it off. No, the portaging, yeah, the portaging, I had a set of wheels. Yeah, I uh, and so I strapped, strapped the wheels on and, and yeah, I mean, you're in the Netherlands and, and in Belgium, there's not really a lot of yeah. hills to deal with. Yes, sir. Insurance was not an issue at all. No, no. I mean, they'll in somebody will insure anything. Um, when I uh, sent it over, I just guessed. <laughs> I was like, this is a year's worth of my time and effort. Um, 
What's that worth? If I was to have to redo that, what do I need to be paid to make that happen? So, yeah, exactly, a gazillion dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, somebody will insure it for that much. It will be close to being the same amount that, um, in any case. Yeah, so it, um, the, the launch party was uh, an over-the-top event um, because it was this sponsorship event, but it was also in the evening, which is not the time to start a canoe trip, right? So I'm in this, this uh, yacht basin on, on the canal just outside of, uh, or just right in, in Leardom, or sorry, right in Lommel. And the, the boat is there, we've, we've, we've dropped it off, ahead of time but there's a the, the it's open to the public it's an evening event there's a four piece uh was well, a five piece accordion band playing four four accordions and drummer uh there's food and drinks and there's a bunch of speeches and and that and that like, the city was right on side the city loved it um, their, their, their culture people were so excited to, to, to be involved in this. The mayor was there. The mayor and uh, um, one of the, one of the, well, it was the, the mayor, the, the guy that runs the yacht club, um, the, um, who else was it? Um, just, I'm pulling a blank. Oh, Yurun, uh, my friend Yurun the director of the, the Glass Center, and I carried the boat down to the water. We put the boat in the water. The, the, uh, the culture uh, counselor for the city hands me a bottle of champagne. Not great champagne, but champagne, and says, christen the boat. And it's like, yeah, I'm not gonna smack my boat with this, this <laughs> bottle. Of, so I, I, I shook it up and popped the top, and I sprayed it at them. <laughs> And if you watch the video, you'll see at the other end, I, I got it given back to me as I was, I was coming. But that was a really nice bottle of champagne, that one that happened at the other end. But it, um, so, so I then got into my canoe and the sponsors and invited guests got onto a cruise boat and followed me down the canal for three kilometers with another band, a, a little, a little uh, string orchestra playing and more food and drinks for them. I'm starving, haven't eaten since lunchtime, and I'm trying to get down this canal and then I have to hop from the canal down into this tiny little river that I'm taking and it's starting to get dark. And I have a campsite that we scouted. Uh, I know where I'm going to go to, but oh god, I'm tired, hungry, and it's getting dark. And there had been a little bit of rain earlier, but then it cleared off, and, uh, and, and so it began. It was, it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. It was over the top, and I was furious as hell because it squeezed my time and I didn't know, but it all worked out beautifully and, uh, you know, couldn't have, couldn't have been better. Had the best weather to be paddling uh, a reflector oven of a boat. <laughs> so, yeah, it was like 21 degrees and sunny the whole time. Northern latitudes and that w the paddling happened in the beginning of September. So it, it, was, it was fine. With the gear in the boat, you really don't. But I had the boat out on, on a little lake locally, uh, Tongamong, where I've got a piece of property. And it was completely clean and shiny new and no writing on the inside. Well, there was no writing when I, had it, when I paddled it in, uh, in the Netherlands either. But um, that was in July before I shipped it out. And I, I totally got fried. I was just like, oh my God, what have I, what have I done? What am I, what am I setting myself up for? Because it was so hot. Yes? You didn't use these paddles to 
I used that paddle uh, to paddle down the canal for that three and a half kilometers and then promptly stowed it and paddled with a paddle that weighs about a third of what that is. Yeah, yeah, it was for photo opportunity. I thought maybe, um, but oh, the weight, the weight difference really takes its toll on you very quickly. Uh, the, the paddles are maps as well. Um, the, the upper one, um, uh, from this side, you, you can see just at the bottom of the paddle, that's actually Stony Lake. And then that's uh, Eels Creek that winds into it. At the top of the blade, that's about where High Falls is. And then I kind of wind the, the, the river up and around that. This uh, paddle, is actually a um, lake called, this is the lake called Tongamong that I just mentioned. Um, and it's part of the Crow River. So the Crow comes down from, uh, uh, I don't know if anyone knows the gut uh, in Lass Wade, just south of uh, Shandos Lake. That would probably be about here. And the Crow winds down and opens up into this little lake that's a couple of kilometers long and then winds off and down through to, uh, to Marmara. So, so these are both places that I know and have paddled. Um, Tongamong in particular um, is a place where I've, I had, I've had the, the immense pleasure of paddling um, at night with my dog in the front of a canoe and absolutely dead calm water and um, I've, I've written a little bit about about this for um, it's it sort of made the rounds a little bit it was on the canoe museum blog um, the the act of, of, of paddling um, when it is that calm at night before the moon comes up clear clear sky and you're, you're paddling through stars. The stars are reflected in the water. So there's this whole experience that you have of, of almost flying as you, as you paddle. Um, and then when the moon does rise, you start to see the light being reflected off the ripples from the, from the canoe and from your paddle. There's a, it just starts to throw this light. And I long wanted to try and capture something of that experience and try and infuse that into a, a, a work, into, into my sculpture. And this, this was the idea, this is where the idea started to do this. That was its, its, its actual essence, it came from that place. Um, but then it, you know, it becomes a, a, a more involved thing as, as the process develops. Um, I'm, I'm, my, my training in, in art and art making um, happened, happens through, happened through uh, Sheridan College, um, the glass program there. So it's the School of Craft and Design. So my, my love of process comes from that place. And process is an incredibly important part of making my art. What, what ends up happening, the final pieces, it's, it's about, you know, that, that, that process informs the work. It, 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 it tells me things, it, it, leads me, it leads me forward. It's like, what are you experiencing here? Why is this happening? Why can't you do that? Why doesn't this work? Well, that starts you, it, it, it forces you to make decisions, you, your, your limitations of, of what your hands are capable of, but that, you, you start to react to that and, and it, 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 it teaches me. And it teaches me about what the work is actually about. So I, I, don't, come, I don't come to my work with a fully formed idea of what it is. 
often I will have the vision of what it is, and that's the starting point. And I trust, I have to trust my process. I don't know why. I don't know what this is fully about. I think I know, there are aspects of it I know, but in the making, that's when, you, that's when I learn what it is that I'm making and, and why. Anyway, reflections. So this, this, this went over and has come back and uh, I can't wait to get it back in the water again. <laughs> this is the piece that I made while I was in, um, in the Netherlands and in Belgium. So it's called waymarking, um, and it's, it, was a real, it, was, it was a real struggle to, to, to make my way through this piece. Um, what, I, what, I, what I had done, I'd, take, I'd taken uh, an old red canoe that was part of, um, came with the cottage resort that, uh, that my family and my, my cousin's family, <laughs> yeah, I think, it, yeah, I think it got used for a lot of things. <laughs> but uh, at, at one point, um, bef yeah, at the beginning of all of this process, I put a call out for, uh, for, for old canoes, or new canoes, whatever, anybody giving up a canoe. And um, I got word from my cousin Gord that that old red canoe doesn't look like it's, it's gonna ever get put back in the water again. So why don't you come and take it? So it, I took that canoe and chopped it up into pieces and packed it into, uh, the mirrored canoe and sent it over to, uh, to Belgium. And then took those pieces and reassembled it uh, about four feet shorter. Um, actually, it was probably when I assembled it initially, I, th I, th I, think, I think it was actually six feet shorter. So it was about 10, ten feet long. Um, but th this boat has ended up stretching out to, to about 12 feet. Um, so what I did, I, I reassembled it, covered it in fiber paper and plaster, and then we attempted uh, a variety of means to get glass onto it. Initially, the idea was that we were going to make a glass canoe that would float. And so that was, that was the goal, and it was a really hard one to let go of because Technically, it's really, really hard to do. So um, the facilities were what they were, and my skills and my understanding of this form and how to make this form work um, needed, needed this experience to happen. That, that glass canoe that will float, it's still out there, and it, it will get made at some point. Um, but it's going to require uh, a different set of circumstances for that to, to, to actually be realized. So we ended up pulling what's, what's known as flat cane. So you take, uh, you gather up hot glass on the end of a blowpipe, you gather up a, quite a bit of hot glass on the end of a blowpipe, and then flatten it and then get it really, really hot, and then working with an assistant, you pull it out like toffee and laid it over the form. So the form is upside down. We lay it over, we take a pencil and draw on either side of that hot glass, and then you have to slide the glass down. You, uh, you, you cut it off the, the hot from the, from the pipe, and then you have to slide it down the form and lift it off and put it into a kiln to slowly cool down. Um, and that process of being able to move it, you have to do when the glass 
is still got heat in it, enough heat that it is actually moving because if you do it when it's set up enough, it's too cold and it doesn't like it and it's going to end up breaking. So it was a real trial and error process to figure out how to do this part um, just to make the, the actual elements. Um, but like I said, I did half the boat in Belgium, the other half I did in the Netherlands. Um, I was working with assistants um, who, were, who were helping me in, in Belgium. When I got to the Netherlands, I had the good fortune to work with a guy named Emil Kovacs, who is a Czech-trained glassblower. He's been, he, he learned how to blow glass um, at the high school. There's a, a, in Novi Bor, there is a glass school um, and he started blowing when he was 14 years old. And that man can handle glass like nobody's business. And the Czechs have a certain way of working, which is um, uh, unlike the way the Italians work, and it's unlike the way the Brits work. And, uh, and these, these are old traditions that, that, um, uh, that they have and it colors the way they make things and, and, and in, in its way it colors what they make. But he's, he was so skilled, it, it took him very little time to figure out how to, how to actually make the, the elements. So I was working as his assistant making the, the other half of the elements, which was a, just a, a fabulous experience. I learned so much. What ended up happening was that we, we we still had to anneal the, the, the glass, and, and you're dealing with a, um, a facility that isn't, um, isn't set up. It is isn't a factory, uh, and we, we realize that after having done it that you know, we really need to do it in a factory setting where we have a rolling, what's called a rolling leer, and you can place each element on its own but we had to stack elements. So sometimes they would bend because they were going away hot or issues happened. So it ended up with pieces that I've had to cut because they were so out of line or there's a bend in them. And all of that was incredibly frustrating because I was still thinking I was making this pristine canoe that could float somehow. Um, and I finally had to give that idea up and realize that I'm dealing with a, a boat that it's the remains of a boat. It's the beautiful memory of a boat that did float. It no longer floats. Hence the title Waymarking. Um, and I'll just leave that there. So, <laughs> it, it got... Uh, it, 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 was, it was for the exhibition. I finished it for the exhibition in Leerdam. Um, and it was presented in a, uh, a glass house with uh, a bed of mirror that was covered in leaves. So you, you just had a sense of something light and floating un underneath it. But it, it was resting there nicely proportioned in, in the glass house. It was, it was a really lovely experience. I had really hoped, or I, I'd had this vision that it would snow and you would have all these dried leaves on the, in, in this glass house, but you know, it's the Netherlands and it, it just rains. <laughs> so, um, okay, so from here, uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk a bit about um, drifting into hubris is the, uh, is the title of this piece here. Yeah, so if you want to please feel free. <laughs> So, so this, the, ins, the inspiration for, for this piece um, came while, while paddling on, on the trip from, from Lommel to Leerdam. Um, what, what, ha what, 
What happened was I, I, I got on to, there, there is this river, the Dommel, which um, ran for about two-thirds of the journey that I was on. It was a, a, a complete surprise that I found uh, a natural water course to travel on. I had really expected that we were just going to be on, I was just going to be on canals. Because um, I thought, okay, there's, there's a canal here in, in Lommel, uh, there's a canal here in Leerdam. Or not a canal, there's actually a river in, in Leerdam. It's water. Everything's connected over there. There's river roads everywhere through that part of Europe, through, through canals. Um, some of them are, go under in, in tunnels. Um, it's, it's just incredible how they made the water roads work there. Um, so I, I, had, I had thought, okay, I am, I'm, I'm going to do this. I have no idea. Let's pull up Google Earth and just see where I'm going to go. It's going to be this canal and this canal. Wait a minute. What's this? Uh, pull it up on satellite, zoom in. It's like, that looks navigable. Um, and, and sure enough, it was. And it's this beautiful little, little river. Um, and it, it begins in northern France and runs into the, um, the Mass River um, at Sertogenbosch. Uh, I always have trouble with that one. It's also known as Dambosch. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway. Um, so so this, this river uh, is this, t it starts off as this tiny little thing. Where I got into it is this tiny little thing. And, and it's issuing out from underneath the canal that I've paddled down uh, at the, the end of this evening and get into it. And it is literally no wider than, than this. But the water is, is moving pretty quick. It's maybe a foot and a half deep, and it's coming from this big cement structure, and the water's just pushing out from there. It's like, okay. Uh, so you get into it, and you get going, and it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's actually quite a natural river. Um, unfortunately, um, as many of the waterways in, in, in Belgium, there, there are no frogs. There was not a frog anywhere. There were no crayfish. There was very little. There was lots of, of bird life. And I see the occasional bit of movement from, from fish. And there were guys fishing uh, along the way. Um, and I one evening had um, a wonderful, odd conversation with a, a young guy who was fishing with his buddies at this one site, and he showed me this thing that he had caught, which is very strange. But any, in any case, in any case, there, there is um, a, lot of, a lot of things have been killed off, but things are coming back. And one of the things that I noticed was how, how, how beautifully clean it was. It was, it was really quite, I mean, you, you almost don't recognize that. You just, you, you're not seeing anything other than natural materials in the, in the river. And part of my journey uh, took me through the city of Eindhoven. And Eindhoven is this uh, progressive uh, town in the Netherlands known for its design, um, the high-tech industry. It's, 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 it's a highly educated hub and, you know, a beautiful old city. It was, it was a, a, a joy to paddle through that city. And at the north end of the city is where uh, the university property comes down to the river, and as soon as I hit the university, that's when all of the beer cans 
and the liquor bottles and the garbage started to show up in the river. There was nothing like that until that point. I'm paddling along and, I'm see, and I saw this beer can just floating so buoyantly and beautifully on top of the water. It was an amazing thing. It was like, look at that. It's a beer can. It's floating like a canoe. I should make canoes out of beer cans. <laughs> I have been, at this point, um, I, I will also say that I've actually been making little canoes out of beer bottles and wine bottles. So I've actually been re-blowing glass bottles into canoe forms and paddles. Uh, I'd done some work with that in previous exhibitions and, and I knew that that might have something going on, but I had never thought of the can. I mean, it's a Grumman canoe. It's, yeah. you know, and, I, and at first I thought, oh, I'll just make a full-size canoe out of beer cans. And I'd still like to do that one. But then that's, that's, another, that's another thing, right? That's trying to figure out how to make that float. I'll help with that one. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. I appreciate your, the offer of help. Um, you will be taken up on it, I'm sure. Um, so, so I... I um, I spent a little time trying to figure out how to do it, actually. How to actually make a canoe out of, out of a beer can. And I thought, okay, you gotta start small, start small. Um, you know, the idea of the full-size one, I quickly realized that, okay, how are you gonna, you know, put them together? You're gonna rivet them together? You're gonna glue all of this stuff together? Um, it's a more complicated process. Why don't you just see if you can make a small one? It'd be really, it would be really cool. Um, and, it, you know, so I taught myself how to do this, but what happened was, as artists in residence at the Canoe Museum, there is a, um, there's a, there's an area where the kids are able to take these sheets of paper and cut out the form of uh, a canoe or a kayak or certain boats from, from the collection and they can color it, cut it out, fold it up and it's like, that's my starting point. Let's take that and figure it out. Understanding that I needed to use two uh, cans in order to make each boat um, was, you know, it was just part of the, part of the process of, of doing that. Um, so you so, so it's, it's a matter of cutting the tops off the, canoe, off the cans, cutting the bottom out of the cans. Well, getting the cans in the first place, which, like, it's, like Sue, Stu was suggesting, um, yes, there was some drinking of, of beer myself, but I ended up, because I decided that I was going to make so many of them, <clears throat> that I actually had to acquire cans. Um, and you cannot buy cans from the beer store because they have no process for things coming, an empty can coming back over the counter. So I was told I can stand out front and buy them from their customers as they're coming in. Uh, but then I realized if I, if I go to um, Young's Point and uh, they have, a, they have a, 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 you know, the license, whatever it is, to the LCBO license where they can sell, but they're also a recycle center. And he was like, you want empty cans? <laughs> Every week, there's a cardboard container that's, that's got a plastic liner in it that fills with canoes. But I had started this in the winter, and there were a lot of bush cans that were acquired at that point, and many of them got the cigarette butts in them, and it's really gross. But anyway, so you got to clean the can. You acquire the cans, clean the cans, then cut the top and bottom off the can and slice it uh, vertically, and you got a sheet. And so I would do that, make those sheets, make those sheets. And in the end, in the end, uh, the, the folding up a canoe process 
think I got it down to about 12 minutes when I was on a real roll. <laughs> but the first ones, I'd say it was like an hour trying to figure out how to make it work, how to bend, what to do, that kind of thing. So it's a, a process again, um, which somehow informs the work. And, that, and then I realized that I actually needed to put mirror in each and every one of them as well. So there, there is a, a, a cut piece of mirror, a cut and ground piece of mirror in, in, inside each of the boats, which is giving some of the, the light. Um, but back to the idea of drifting into hubris. Um, it's this education center, this place this of higher learning that I'm seeing all of this trash. And it makes me wonder, what is it about that? Why do, why do, we, why do we do that? Why, why is it that these people who are being trained, these young people who are being trained uh, to think, don't? Or do they? I'm not sure, I don't understand, but it's th this act of tossing our trash into the river. Um, that's some of what goes on here. Um, it, it also ends up uh, being a, a, a commentary on uh, my own uh, glass community as well. And since I don't see anyone from that community here, <laughs> no, I won't, I, won't, I won't carry on with that one. That, that's a conversation for, for, the, for the glass community. Um, the, uh, and, and so we, we I, needed to, I needed to make them, and then I needed to try and figure out how many do I need to make? And that, you know, at first it was like, oh, okay, well, how many have I got? All right, I got a hundred and some here. Um, that'll cover so much space. How many more? Uh, 365? One for every day? Does that make sense? No, that's not, you know, I, I just sort of rolled up to that number and then, um, I, I hit upon the number 467. And, and this, in some ways, this connects to the, the, the coat piece. And it, it actually probably um, uh, is more, more, in some ways, is, is, is more relevant to, to the coat piece, but it gave me a number. So, while I was, while I was uh, artist in residence at the, the Canoe Museum, one of the, uh, there is there, there all of this incredible information available. And there are these two books, these two big sort of, um, I, I'm not sure, it's a, there, it's a lot of didactic material in it, you know, but it's, it's all printed formally, it's all in script and, it's on this heavy canvas paper with these reproductions of old photographs and, or old paintings um, in that. And one's the history of the Northwest Company and one's the history of the Hudson's Bay Company. And somehow or other I figured the Hudson's Bay Company might have had something to do with having these things made because they look pretty good. The Northwest Company, they don't look so good in the reading, when you read, read through these things. But um, there, was a, there was a line in the Northwest Company uh, book which said that in 1803, the Northwest Company brought 21,000 gallons of liquor into the interior of the country. And the Hudson's Bay Company felt they had no, <laughs> sorry, I'm not sure why this is doing, 
Ugh. It's not that sad. It, no, it is that sad. It is this sad. I shouldn't be letting it. I've done this so many times in my head. Anyway, um, the Hudson's Bay Company felt they had no choice but to follow suit or lose trade. So they had no choice. And then it goes on to say how this began a destruction of the indigenous peoples. So we're bringing this liquor in, and I say we, because it is done by and for us in so many ways. These are our people, my people. Sorry, no, sorry, let me rephrase. Not our, because I can't say that. I have no idea. I'd say that these are my, this is my, my history. Um, you know, this was done in, the, in terms of capitalism to bring, you know, it's, it's the, oh, really? We just don't give a shit about people. We're going to do this and because we can make money. And we all know this. We know this happens. And it still happens. But, um, Reading this, it really, it really struck. Uh, it really struck me, and um, started to to make me think about our relationships. This idea, which is now um, in in academic terms, um, is referred to as indigenous settler relations, and. And so I'm, I'm, I'm starting to, to, to try and deal with some of this kind of stuff, trying to understand my position, my place in, in that kind of a discussion. Um, and so reading that, reading that, it was like, okay, this, this is not, not so good, but if you take 21,000 gallons and you convert that to liters, okay, each of these boats is two beer cans. That's a a liter. If it's European beer, it's a liter. If it's Canadian, it's a little shy, right? They make them smaller and charge you more. Um, add 95,000 to the number that are here, and that's how many liters in 1803 were brought into the country. I don't know. It says something to me. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Getting myself wound up. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll walk over here to this other piece, which in some ways is more directly. That gave me a number for that. It's not necessarily directly what that is about, but this, this, this piece is more, more directly related to that. Um, it's called a, a coat full of colonial chic. Um, and it's, it's, it's based on the idea of the, the, it's a movie trope, the coat full of contraband with the, the watches hanging on, on the inside of the trench coat. And what you have hanging on the inside of this incredibly beautiful coat, which my dear friend E.P. is hands are, her hands are all over this. This would not have happened without E.P.'s help. Um, The, the, this, this coat is, is full of glass canoes. And these, are, these are all canoes that have been um, reblown from wine bottles or beer bottles. So this, this one is much more directly related to the ideas that I was just I was talking about there. Um, the coat itself is, uh, is, is the pattern is a Chesterfield, 
um, which is a, uh, uh, it's essentially the, 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 the basis for all modern trench coats. So I'm trying to bring it forward by using a certain kind of pattern, but the, the, it's made out of a blanket material and, and they're not specifically Hudson's Bay blankets, but they reference that. And so I, I did a lot of research around um, the smallpox and uh, the smallpox related to blankets. And, that, and, and that, that whole history um, you know, is, is, is quite distressing. Um, and and that, that there, there is actually white, white documentation of the use of smallpox as a biological weapon. It actually was done, not just a story. Um, although many stories come from it. Um, but it also, the idea of, of, you know, disease or disaster being embedded in a, into a, a, a garment goes much further back. It's actually um, what killed Hercules um, was a, a coat that was infected with the blood of um, some, a, a creature that he killed because that creature was trying to steal his wife. We'll, we'll say wife, who knows. Uh, the woman that he loved at the time was being stolen by this creature and he killed it. And as that creature was dying, turned to the woman that he had uh, stolen and said, if you give Hercules this coat, if he ever loses interest in you and turns to another, then um, he, will, he will be returned to you. And she believed him, and it happened many years later, and he died because it had the poison that was in the poison of the arrow that he shot. The anyway, it's all convoluted. And um, so, so there's, there is a great deal of history and mythology around the ideas of the poison garment, but there is reality of it as well. It happened. We, the English general who wrote to his subordinates and told them to do this, you know, it's there. Uh, Amherst did do that. It's, it's, it's on the record, on our record. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it is, a, it is a, an incredible, um, it's incredibly rich, the, the, these ideas and what's imbued in material simply by using a, a, a particular material. Um, so a blanket coat full of glass canoes for sale. You know, the idea of selling it back to ourselves, selling back, are we selling back an idea of what canoeing is? You know, it's a recreational activity uh, on the lake, a lot of drinking involved. Um, you know, are, are we, there, there, there's so much that I have thought of and, and brought into this, but it came as a vision. This idea came to me, or not this idea, but this vision of this coat came to me, and it's like, I gotta make it, and I don't know why. And so all of this stuff happens as you're going along, thinking about it, working on it, making it, making it come together. Um, the oily material on the outside, um, this, um, is, it's all been uh, needle felted down. Um, 
I'm, I'm gonna turn into a textile artist now, forget this glass stuff. God, needle felting is so much fun. Um, uh, such, a, such a pleasure to do. Um, uh, it's, it's, like, it's like this oil that's being dripped down the, the outside of it. And so I'm, I'm also trying to, to bring, bring this notion of you know, the past into the present. Are we doing the same thing with our resources now? What are we doing? Are we, we're stealing them, we're taking them, and, 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 and we, you know, giving them away. Um, coat full of colonial chic. Okay. Um, I'm not, I, I, yeah, I'm going to lose my train of thought there, so I'm going to keep moving. You guys don't need to be inside on such a beautiful day, but thank you all again for coming. Um, where are we going to go? Let's go over here and we'll continue with this, this one. Um, you doing all right? Yeah, we're fine. Okay. Uh, trophy hunted. Um, What's it called? Great White Privilege. Trophy Hunted. Um, so this is, this, this is actually uh, the, the prototype for the, not the prototype, but my, my tester piece for the, for the, uh, the mirrored canoe. Uh, I, I started with this. And this is actually a map of Sturgeon Lake, um, where I grew up. Um, and it, 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 was, it, was the, it was the, um, it was the test, it was the test for adhesives and uh, what, what's going to work if I actually paddle something. So I, tr I tried a bunch of different materials on it, um, uh, on, the, on the backs of the mirror and soaked it and then tried to peel them off and that kind of thing and figured out which, which glue to actually use. Um, but then I finished it off. I finished this thing off and, and, and made this, um, this element. And, and it sat around for the longest time without the gunnels on it. It was just this mirrored piece. And it, it, just, it, it started to talk to me um, about what it wanted to be. And it's, I, I, I got this um, mount made for it, the, the walnut. Uh, plaque was made by um, a woodworker named Britt O'Lawson. She's up in um, up in Apsley. Um, and does beautiful work. So she made she made that that plaque for me. I I drew, I drew it out. And it's you know canoe like in its way, but it's also it. I mean it's a it's a trophy. It's a trophy hunted thing. We I have had the immense privilege of being able to do this and make this and take this somewhere. And I feel like I, I'm trying very hard to do something worthy of the efforts and um, The, 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 the trust that the, that the Canada Council of the Arts has put into me for making the work, that there will be something meaningful and useful from that. And when I say the Canada Council for the Arts, I do mean all of you, because you support that with your tax dollars. And that means you're supporting me by that. So um, that's just my little plug for the Canada Council. Thank you. Um, none of this can happen without all of that support. You know, this is not work that is um, going to generate a lot of income. So <laughs> we got to we got to be supported in some way in order to make it work. Um, and I'm very privileged to have that support. Um, so this is somewhat self-referential as well, but the idea of 
of a place being um, trophy hunted is something that we do without thinking. Let's, you know, let's go here. Let's go there. And we'll just acquire that experience. Um, do we really understand where we're going and why we're going there? And, 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 I, and I think some of us, we, we, I think I try. I try to do that, and I really tried to tr do that with this, but it is, it is the kind of thing that, can, that, that happens. Um, the, there's there's a, 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 a book uh, of letters that were written by um, uh, probably then young man to his family back in, in the UK as he homesteaded on Sturgeon Lake as he um, did the, the process of cutting the acreage, of acquiring the land, uh, fulfilling the requirements or paying people to fulfill the requirements for him to have that because he did come from a wealthy family um, and was able to do that. Although you know, not, not to discount the hardships that anyone would have gone through in, in doing that kind of thing, but that acquisition of land, um, uh, reading those letters, that, that acquisition of land has always struck me as, as difficult in some ways. I do, uh, I mean, it, it, is, it is the place that I grew up, um, Sturgeon Lake, um, so there's that understanding some of that that history um, of the of settler culture um, was was a was was a really important for me to to read that and 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 that also was a starting point for trying to understand this relationship that we have with with the indigenous peoples or that. I am trying to understand my relationship in that place. Um, hence the subtitle is, is Sturgeon Lake. Um, and when you shine light on it from here, like I had the studio lights in there, it throws these antlers up either side. It's really amazing, but you know, it's an awkward way to point light during a setup, so you may, might try and get another photo of it that way. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> the last piece uh, to talk about, unless anybody has any questions about anything else, I will continue to rattle on here. Um, is, is this piece. Um, and this is called Confluence, a um, place where two rivers meet. Um, it's, um, and I, I encourage you, if you haven't walked around and under the piece, please, please do. Um, there, there are these uh, portable canoes they, 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 they detach. Um, I'm sorry, EP. What are they called? Sectional. Were they sectional? Yeah. Again, yeah, Jeremy had a name for it. There were, it was the guy who, who actually um, first started doing it. I don't know, Taylor or somebody like that. And he called them Taylor canoes. Or it wasn't Taylor, it was something. Somebody's name. In any case, he, he, took, he took cedar strip canoes um, canvas covered steer strip canoes and cut them into pieces and, and made them so that you could attach them together with hardware. But they'd come apart, you could stack them together and stick them inside a float plane. Um, and and there, there are, um, when I first started coming to the canoe museum on a regular basis, there was a, an exhibition of um, portable canoes, and this was one of them. Uh, 
and I, I remember being totally fascinated with it. Um, the, the connection to the float plane, well, you know, Uncle Bill flew float planes. That's the plane that I, those were the first planes I'd ever been up in. Um, and until I was in my mid-twenties was the only kind of plane I'd, I was ever in was a float plane. Um, maybe a, maybe a, 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 you know, one with skis on it, but never wheels. Um, so so there's, there, is this, the, there is this nostalgic draw to that as well, uh, that, that canoe, because of that, that connection. Um, I, I just loved the way it looked, the way it came apart. Um, and, I, and I thought, I want to take, I want to make this X, this confluence, this thing coming together. Um, X's have long been in my repertoire of, of forms that I, I work with for, for whatever reason that they become a starting point for, for things. Um, and so I wanted to do that with, with, with a couple of canoes that I'd been given. This green one um, was, was uh, an odd, uh, uh, it was an odd acquisition and the odd, odd way that you put out a call that would, you know, could you, is anybody interested in giving up their old canoes? And, um, it, that call got passed on by others, and this boat turned up. It's, um, owned, it was owned by uh, a, a gentleman who used to be an Olympic paddler uh, for Canada, um, and he lived in Montreal, and I can't remember his name um, at, the, at the moment, but his uh, family, um, this was his recreational canoe, and they were ready to get rid of it because um, it's really heavy. <laughs> and you know, modern canoes are much, uh, much, uh, much more manageable. Um, and they, and then, so that that one came off of Shand, uh, off Shandos Lake, and the red canoe came off Anstruther, um, and it was one that uh, my neighbor Paul. He, he does a lot of work for people on, on Shandos Lake, or sorry, on Anstruther Lake, and this canoe had had a tree drop on it um, one winter, and it was in pretty rough shape to begin with, and, and so the, the owners thought maybe it was time to get rid of it, and Paul said, well, I know somebody who'd like to have it, and, and so it came to me. It was not in that bad a shape, really. When you, you took the old gunnels off of it and straightened it out, it was actually, yeah, that's it's, it's still a good canoe. It's still, it's still got lots of life in it. Um, and so, and so I, I began a process of, of, of putting these things together. And I wanted to do the X. I was like, okay, now it's this huge unmanageable thing. Well, if I do it in this sectional way, which references the float plane, a propeller, um, then, then it, it, it'll be manageable. I can take it apart and, and get it in and out of the gallery. I can, I can, I can ship it to, onto its next, uh, its next place of showing, and it'll be awesome in the water. <laughs> it truly will, because this sucker, this sucker floats. <laughs> It's amazing. You got to check out the inside if you haven't already. It's like this is a party boat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and it comes back full circle. But in in so many ways, it's simply an X. And um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Again, I would like to thank everyone here at the Art Gallery of Peterborough. It's been such a pleasure working with everyone. 
Um, the install crew here are amazing. Oh my God. They're amazing. They're amazing, <laughs> patient, work with you, allow you to do, allow you to do. So thanks um, again. Yeah, I, I'm glad that we stopped at this one because it's so much about, you know, meeting people and spending time together. And um, we invite you to hang out with us until five o'clock. We're open until then. We've got some refreshments upstairs. If you have um, other questions or wanted to chat with Brad, he's around. Pretty personable. Pretty approachable. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And um, the show is up until, until September 4th. So we, we invite you to come back and, uh, and hang out in it. Um, and yeah, again, thank you all for coming. I'm glad that you thanked the Canadian, uh, the Ca Canada Council for the Arts because I didn't at the beginning. Yes. And uh, yeah, so we always uh, want to uh, acknowledge the support of our funders, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, and the City of Peterborough. Thank you all so much.